Good morning and welcome to New Community Church Online again. I hope you are all faring well, at least maintaining in the current season that we're in. I know that I am not alone in being over this. Like if we're honest and we're real, this isn't fun anymore. I'm over not being able to sit in Starbucks on Monday morning to get my week started. I'm over Zoom calls and video chats to hang out with people. I'm, I'm over not being able to go sit at Three Amigos and eat my weight and chips and white dip. But there's a light at the end of the tunnel. See, Virginia has moved into phase two. That means that my barber back in Newport News is open this week. And by the time you are watching this on Sunday morning, these, these beautiful locks will be no more. I've been working outside a lot more during this quarantine and everything, and uh, working in the North Carolina heat and humidity is not for me um, with this long hair. So I'm getting it all chopped off, but that is the light at the end of the tunnel. And, and I encourage you to find something to be grateful for. It's really, really easy right now to just be angry and frustrated at, at a lot of things. But we have to choose not to dwell on those things. We have to choose to dwell on those things that, that bring us joy, that, that we're grateful for. And I, I do want to say a quick prayer before we, before we jump in and move on with our series, Messy. So let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning. We are we're struggling, a lot of us. We're struggling to, to maintain the same levels of things that we had at the beginning of this quarantine. We're struggling to find excitement in everyday life. Some of us are, are struggling to find excitement in, in watching online services. Father, we long to be back in person. Father, it's my prayer that we can find at least one thing, though, to be grateful for that we can find one thing that can bring us joy and we can focus on that so we don't have to dwell on those things that can just leave us angry, bitter, and frustrated. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to bring your message this morning. I thank you for this opportunity to continue on in our series as we talk about loving people and how hard that can be and how messy it gets. Father, I pray that the words that come out of my mouth are yours and that they will land on ears and hearts that are receptive. Amen. So last week, as I mentioned, we kicked off a brand new series about loving people and how messy it can be loving people. And Pastor Rob shared some great tips when it comes to dealing with difficult people and loving difficult people. People. And if you, if you missed that, I highly encourage you, go check it out. It's on our Facebook. It's on our YouTube. You can find links to it on our website. Go check it out. And as Rob shared last week, we, we truly feel that this series is timely. Because right now, we are all stuck at home for the most part with people that we love, but those same people can be difficult. I know that I am not always easy to get along with for my wife, Morgan, and our poor dog, Charlie. I know that I absolutely annoy him being home all day long. It's not easy when you're stuck at home loving people all of the time. And this whole series is based around what Jesus said is the second greatest commandment. The first is, is love the Lord your God with everything you have. And he says the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And that commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, I truly believe is the crux of everything we believe in. It is the crux of our faith. The only practical way that we can demonstrate our love of God is to love our neighbors. The only practical way we can show that we love God is by loving those around us. And that leads to the age-old question that pops up in Luke chapter 10, who is my neighbor? See, a teacher of the law, a Jewish expert in the law had asked Jesus, what do I have to do to uh, inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, what do you think you need to do? And the guy said, well, you know, I need to love God with everything I have. I need to love my neighbor as myself. You know, I need to do these things. And Jesus says, 
yeah, that's pretty spot on. Good job. And the guy says, but wait a minute, Jesus. Who is my neighbor? This expert in the law was trying to justify his, his inaction more than likely. And what Jesus said turned them on their heads. What Jesus said turned the norm, flipped it upside down. So go ahead and follow with me in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 through 35. It says, Jesus took up the question, which there in the Greek, it means that he saw this guy wanted a debate. So Jesus entered into the debate. Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. On the other side. A Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, also passed by on the other side. A priest and a Levite passed by on the other side side. But a Samaritan, a Samaritan on his journey came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. He took pity on him. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. And then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him. When I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. This story, the story of the Good Samaritan, is one of Jesus' most famous and most controversial teachings and stories. And really, it's the perfect response to the somewhat trick question of who is my neighbor. See, this path that, that the man was walking down was known in the region as the Pass of Blood. It, it, was, a, it was a mountainous road going down from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and robbers, bad people, loved to take advantage of the twists and the turns and the caves and the cliffs. So it was no surprise that this man fell victim to an attack, to an assault, and left for dead on his journey. But what is surprising is the three different reactions from three different people who stumble upon his body. First, we have a priest. And our reaction, and I'm sure the reaction of those listening to Jesus tell the story was probably a reaction of relief. They're probably thinking, good, a good, godly, religious man has found this, this poor soul beaten and left for dead, and he's going to take care of him. Except he didn't. He said he got to the other side of the road to pass him by. And I, like you, I'm sure, are left with some questions. And I've heard some good arguments as for why this priest, this godly, righteous man, would pass by this poor man, half dead, who needed help. And some will argue that this priest was headed to perform his priestly duties. He was headed to service and therefore couldn't be made ceremoniously unclean by touching what he assumed was a dead body. And that's almost commendable that he would sacrifice doing a good work so that he could go and, and perform his priestly duties. But there's a problem with that. The problem is that Jesus specifies that this priest was going down the road. And that might not mean much to you, but on this road, you have Jerusalem at the top of the mountain, and the road goes down to Jericho. So what it meant was that to travel to Jerusalem, you went up the road. If you were leaving Jerusalem, you went down the road. And this priest was traveling down the road. So his duties as a priest were already done. 
he was free to help this man out. As for the Levite, we don't know whether he was traveling up the road or down the road, but he, like the priest, saw the man laying on the road and passed by on the other side. He made it a point to switch sides of the road. And while we don't know whether the man was headed to or from Jerusalem specifically, we can kind of gather that he was headed away from Jerusalem. Because we know this, that priests and Levites who were headed up to Jerusalem to perform their duties traveled in groups. If they were headed towards Jerusalem to perform their duties, they would not be traveling alone. And this Levite was alone. So he was going home after fulfilling his duties. See, neither the priest or the Levite had a religious reason to not help this man. Their only excuse for not helping was that they were selfish. Their only excuse was their selfish, uh, their selfishness with their time. Then we get the plot twist of all plot twists. Like I said, this story, this account kind of flips it on its head and Jesus shocks everyone because he says a Samaritan walking along the road sees the man, takes pity on him, and uses his own supplies and his own money to take care of the man. Why is this a big deal? Because Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Absolutely disdained one another. See, Jews viewed Samaritans as filthy half-breeds. It's very, very Draco Malfoy of them. Under normal circumstances, a Samaritan would never stop and help a Jew, and a Jew would never stop and help a Samaritan. It would be like if I came across a man in need who was wearing a Yankees jersey, and I decided to stop and help him. It is not expected among groups who can't stand each other. But this Samaritan used his wine to disinfect the wounds. He used his oil to soothe the man's pain. He used his donkey to carry the man into town. He used his money to pay for the room and any other expenses this poor man accrued during his stay at the end. At the end. This Samaritan didn't see a Jew laying half dead in the road. He saw another human being who needed to be loved. He didn't see a Jew laying half dead. He saw another human being who needed to be loved. So Jesus gets done telling the story, and he looks at this expert of the law. He looks at this lawyer and asks him, who was the neighbor in that story? And the lawyer responds, the one who showed mercy. And that's another telltale sign of the the animosity between Jews and Samaritans because the Jewish lawyer wouldn't even say the word Samaritan. He said, the one who showed mercy. The big picture here that we get through the story of the Good Samaritan to be, to be applied through the lens of loving people, even when it's messy, is that your neighbor is whoever is in front of you. And for most of you right now, I'm in front of you. Some of you, your family members are in front of you. And I don't mean directly in front of you. I don't mean, you know, if you turn around and there's your husband, your wife, your child, like, yes, they're your neighbor, yes, love them. But what it means is whoever is in your path that needs love is your neighbor. And church, I would argue that every single one of us needs love. So anyone in your path is your neighbor. And we can't love everyone. There's no possible way that I can love every single human being on earth in practical ways. I know that. I'm aware of of that. But we can love whoever is in front of us. 
And this, this idea is summed up in an Andy Stanley quote, and I love this quote. Pastor Andy Stanley says, do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. Do for one what you wish you could do for everyone. And I love that quote, and I love the way Orange uses it. And if you're not familiar with Orange, Orange is the Christian organization that develops all of the curriculum we use for babies through seniors in high school. I love Orange. I go to the Orange Conference every single year. Um, I buy t-shirts and mugs and books and all sorts of things. But they have taken this Andy Stanley quote, and they have altered it to fit small groups. And their alteration of this Andy Stanley quote has become my personal mission for ministry. And the way Orange puts it is, do for a few what you wish you could do for many. And I have this mug up here with me, and uh, on this mug, it even says, do for a few. Because like I said, I have adopted this quote as my personal mission for ministry, my personal vision is to make sure every student I come in contact with feels known, heard, and loved. And how do I do that? By doing for a few what I wish I could do for many. And if you're a kids' community volunteer, you've heard me say that. If you're a student ministries volunteer, you have heard me say that just about every single week that we're together. Do for a few what you wish you could do for many. And this attitude, this do for a few attitude, is the proper attitude to have in response to the story of the Good Samaritan. Love the person in front of you. You you can't possibly love every single person in the world. There's a lot of people. You're not going to meet every single person in the world. You can't possibly love them all, but do for one. Do for a few what you wish you could do for many. In Galatians 6, verses 9, in the first half of verse 10, the Apostle Paul puts it like this. He says, let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us work for the good of all. And what does this look like? In a COVID-19 world, what does this do for one, do for a few attitude look like in a world of, of social distancing and caps on the number of people that can meet together at one time? Well, here are a few ways where you can do for a few in today's climate. Here are some ways that you can do for a few in the craziness of a COVID-19 world. First, Do something kind for an essential worker. Whether it's a healthcare worker, uh, somebody who, you know, they stock the shelves at Food Lion or Walmart, do something kind for an essential worker. If you know someone who's an essential worker right now, mow their grass. If If you're not physically able to mow their grass, go do their grocery shopping for them. I'm not saying necessarily buy their groceries. If you feel led to do that, absolutely do it but offer to go pick up their groceries for them. Buy them a meal, make them a meal, and take it to them. Write them an encouraging note. Do for a few what you wish you could do for many. The second way to to live out Galatians 6 and the story of the Good Samaritan and this do for a few attitude, the second way to do that in a COVID-19 world is to reach out to someone in the at-risk And the at-risk group isn't just those people that are above a certain age. The at-risk group are those people with, you know, a compromised immune system, an immunodeficient uh, condition, somebody, you know, with asthma. They are in the at-risk group. Reach out to them. Check in with them. Pray with them. Pray for them. Take them. Take them coffee. Take them a meal. See if they need anything at all that you can do. Do for a few what you wish you could do for many. Number three, be patient. Please be patient 
with the workers while you're out and about. Whether it's doing your grocery shopping, whether it's hitting up TJ Maxx, going and grabbing a quick bite to eat, whatever it is, be patient with the workers while you're out. I was at Lowe's last week. I've been working on a project up here at the church, um, and I had to go to Lowe's and grab some paint. So I go, and I go into Lowe's, and I look, and I go ahead, and uh, they didn't have the exact paint, you know, finish or whatever that I needed on the shelf. So I went ahead, and I stood in line at the paint desk. And there were probably 10 people total in line, each of us needing multiple gallons of paint tinted and mixed and given to us. So I'm standing there in line. I wait my turn. I I tell the, the nice woman who's working there what I need. She says, yep, I'll get that done. It'll be about 25, 30 minutes. I say, great, not an issue. I go, I wander around Lowe's. Me and Morgan have just started. Uh, We planted some flowers and stuff a couple weeks ago, and I need some things for around the house. So I was wandering around, looking at things that I needed, seeing if there was anything else I could pick up while I was there. And so about 25, 30 minutes goes by, and I, I walk back to the paint department. I walk back to the paint desk, and I see that my order is just getting ready to come out of the mixer So I just lean off to the side and I wait, out of the way, just like, all right, it's almost time, I'll hang out. While I'm sitting there waiting, this man who had been two to three people behind me in line comes up to the counter, looks at the woman and says, just cancel my order, go put it back on the shelf, I'm done waiting. And I'm like, all right, this guy's not having a good day and this is just kind of pushing him over the edge and and the, the paint department worker She says, sir, I'm so sorry, you are next. I promise you, just give me like five, ten more minutes, and I'm going to get this done for you. And he goes, I don't have that time. And she goes, sir, I'm so sorry to hear that. You know, I'm doing the best that I can. I'm the only one working in the paint department right now. And he goes, well, you need to get somebody else down here with you if you can't keep up. And I'm sitting here like, ooh, buddy. Mm. Like, if you're familiar with the Enneagram, I am an eight, and part of that, part of my personality that God gave me is that I like to stick up for people. I like to come to the aid of those in need, not in a like, oh, I'm a hero type way. Sometimes that arrogance flies in there, but most of the time it's just I want to stick up for people. I want to speak out against injustice, so this guy's sitting here just letting this woman have it, being rude, and I'm like, Lord, give me the strength. I'm about to lose my cool in the middle of Lowe's, and this is a small town. People know who I am. They know where I work. Be a compelling presence. Be a compelling presence. Be a compelling presence. I could have really used Rob's message then about loving difficult people, but that wouldn't happen for another couple days. Anyway, I'm sitting there. I take some deep breaths, and I'm like, don't say anything. This guy's just having a bad day. Don't say anything. So the woman apologizes. The guy just gets frustrated even more and says, well, if you're the only one working, you need to tell your manager to hire more help. And the woman, just trying to stay calm, goes, sir, I tell my manager every day that we need to hire somebody else. You know, maybe if you tell her, maybe if you mention something to her, she'll, you know, consider it more and actually get me somebody else to work alongside me. And the guy goes, I complain every time I'm in this place. Nothing ever changes. I'm a contractor. I deserve better than this. And I just continued to sit there. Didn't open my mouth because I knew it wouldn't be good if I did. But the man leaves after, you know, saying that he deserves better because he's a contractor. And I get it. We have contractors that, you know, attend new communities, so don't hear me like I'm bashing contractors. I get it. I've worked on building projects before. You have deadlines. And a 30-minute wait at Lowe's can actually derail a project days. And if you're a contractor, you don't have that time. So I get why this man was frustrated, but that doesn't justify the way he spoke to this woman. So he leaves, and she goes ahead and lets me know that my order's done. And I walk up, and I grab my two gallons of paint, and she goes, Sir, thank you so much for being patient. And I looked at this woman who had just been absolutely reamed by some random guy. And I just shared with her, I said, No, thank you. Like, thank you for coming into work. Thank you for working hard to get this done. You know, people just need to realize that they need to be patient. 
we're all struggling in these times. We're all just frustrated and worn out. And a little bit of patience will go a long way. And the woman, fighting back tears, thanked me for my kind words, and I checked out and went on my way. And I don't share that story to make me look good. No, because honestly, through the course of my life, more times than not, I've been the angry contractor. It's something that I've been working on, and only over the past couple of years have I been able to, you know, actually like not do stuff like that. But no, I share this. Because we have to remember that these people working at places like Lowe's and Walmart and TJ Maxx, they are just as stressed as we are. They're struggling just like we are. They're trying to adjust just like we are, and they still have to deal with the general public every single day. And stressed out people trying to work with stressed out people usually doesn't go well. And so that's why the the third tip, the third thing you can do to do for a few in this COVID-19 world is to be patient with these workers while you're out and about. Extend them grace. And if you have an opportunity, speak an encouraging word into them. Do for a few what you wish you could do for many. And the fourth and final thing I want you to try to do, to do for a few and live out the Good Samaritan story in this world Don't try to rush back into things. This one's tough. I know some of you are going to disagree with me, and that's okay. You're allowed to disagree with me. You know, sometimes the Apostle Paul shares like, this is my opinion, not necessarily saying it's a rule, and this right here is my opinion. This is how I'm kind of walking through this. So you can disagree with me when I say don't try to rush back into things. Like I said at the beginning of my message, I'm tired of living in an online-only world. You know, I'm tired of video church. I'm tired of Zoom staff meetings. Like, I'm ready to be back in person with people. I am a super extrovert. I miss it. I long for the days where we can meet back in person. However, if taking it slow means that the people I love and care about will be less at risk, then I'll do it. There's some of you watching right now that I love dearly. I love all of you. Don't hear me wrong. Love all of you. But there's some of you watching that are in that at-risk category. I want you to be safe. So if, if, if waiting another month is what we need to do, then I'm going to do it. I'll do online church for as long as I need to if it means that the people I love and care about are safe. If waiting another few weeks will keep my my grandparents alive, I'll do it. If waiting another few weeks will keep a kids community volunteer with, with an immunodeficient disorder, if it'll keep them safe, then I'm gonna do it. Do for a few what you wish you could do For many, I know we want to be back in person. I know we want things to go back to normal. But we have to take it slow. We have to make sure that we have the best interest of the people in mind. Do for a few what you wish you could do for many. A few weeks back, I was driving home from Virginia, uh, me and a couple other youth pastors who had self-quarantined and self-isolated for two weeks and not really, you know, exposed ourselves to uh, public. We got together to watch the Orange Conference online at a church uh, up in Virginia. Don't worry, we were absolutely socially distanced. We had a space the size of this whole stage, and like we didn't come closer than like 10 feet of each other. So don't worry. I know I just got done talking about keeping it slow. We were safe. Promise. But anyway... I was driving home from being up in Virginia watching the Orange Conference, and I was jamming out to Elevation Worship's newest album, Graves Into Gardens. And they have a song. It's the second track on the deluxe version of the album. It's called My Testimony. And the lead singer, Chris Brown, is singing about how, you know, I saw Satan fall like lightning. I've seen darkness run and hide. But the miracle that I can't get over is that my name is registered in heaven. 
And so I was focusing on that line. My name is registered in heaven. And I was thinking about how much God loves each and every one of us. That if we call Christ Lord, our names are registered in heaven. And a thought popped into my head, and I want to share that thought with you now. As I'm sitting here thinking about how much God loves me, how much God loves us, the thought that popped in my head was, if anything about me is found to be offensive, let it be how much I love others and how liberally I show grace. If anything about me is to be found offensive, let it be how much I love others and how liberally I I show grace. That's what it looks like to love our neighbors. That's what it looks like to do for a few. And as you go about your daily life, what are you focused on? Are you focused on only your needs and your wants? Maybe when you're out and about and you go about your life, you're only focused on your phone in front of you. But what if instead you focused on those people around you. You focused on those people in front of you, those people in your path. What if instead you focused on the needs of the cashier at Food Lion or the hurts of the paint department employee at Lowe's? What matters is faith expressing itself through love. Faith expressing itself in love. So as we go about our lives, let's recognize that our neighbors are those in front of us. Wherever we go, those people in front of us, wherever we go, who need to be loved offensively and shown grace liberally. And as you go, do for a few what you wish you could do for many. Let's pray. Father, loving people is difficult. I, I know you get that because you have watched your creation that you love defy you and rebel against you for thousands of years. I know you understand how messy it is loving people. I know you relate to us and our difficulties in loving people. Father, as we read Jesus' account, the story of the Good Samaritan, let us not be like the priest. Let us not be like the Levite. Let us be like the Good Samaritan. Let us recognize the needs of those people in our path. Let's love them and show them grace liberally. Father, help us do for a few what we wish we could do for many. Amen.